but I will be here, um, and we'll continue on as, uh, as usual unless something changes drastically. <clears throat> we also need to pray for several people that are just traveling. They've just been gone on vacation this week and so forth, and um, keep them in your prayers as well. So open to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. <clears throat> We are in the prologue, the first eight verses, which gave us a title, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then there's this chain of communication that he reveals in the middle of verse one through verse two. A blessing pronounced for reading and understanding the words of this prophecy. The author, the audience, the greeting is all stated in verse four, the source is the triune God, 4D, the last part of verse 4 into verse 5. And then the subject, 5B through verse 8. We will conclude with verse 8 today and start uh, verse 9 next week. <clears throat> Before we pray, think of this. What we're going to talk about in verse 8 is so profound. And I guarantee you at the end of this, You'll say, wow, this really hurt my head and stretched my mind. And, but if we're dealing with the all living God who's infinite, shouldn't it do that? If we can walk away going, oh, I got God reduced down to something less than me. As I said earlier in that theoretical box, have we really defined God? I think it should leave us with our heads hurting. <laughs> and so we're going to look at one verse today that has a lot of complexity, but just so profound and I have found John, if you read the Greek language, he's really one of the easier guys to read in Greek. Uh, when you go to seminary, they start you on sentences from John, First John, Gospel of John, because they're more simple. However, his doctrine is so profound. He's the one that will say, Jesus is eternal God become flesh. Is that not profound? How does eternal God acquire humanity and then go to a cross and bear our sins in his own body, yet remain complete deity and un undiminished deity and true humanity in one person. No, Jesus is not complex. And I think we ought to, in our worship, which is uh, part of it is just understanding who God is and God lets us do that. We need to think through verse eight carefully. Um, and what a lot of people do, they'll skip it because said, well, it hurts people's heads. And then you don't get the blessing of getting into some more detail and getting a little deeper in your knowledge of God, because doesn't the Bible command us to learn about Jesus? Second Peter 3.18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If we're willing to do that today, we're obeying a command in Second Peter 3.18. Did we pray? Let's do that. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. And we know this book contains terrible judgments that will rain down from heaven on this world one day we know jesus will come back victorious but let us just focus on jesus christ today lord uh, deepen deepen our understanding and our faith in who he is and we know it'll help us in our own worship our own relationship with you and also how to defend the person of christ to a world that often comes against him denying his person, denying that he's God and so forth. I think today will be helpful as well. So, Lord, may this time together just benefit us in so many different ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> verse 1. Let's look at the prologue and then get to verse 8. So the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's the title. Notice it's not revelations. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which... God gave him to show his bondservant. So the father gave the revelation to Jesus to show his bondservants. There's that chain. What, what did he give it to us for or what does it do? It shows us the things which must soon take place. Yeah, almost 2,000 years and still hadn't happened. So don't think soon always means the next day. And he sent and communicated it by his angel, so an angelic being, to his bondservant, John, who, that's John, testified to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So over and over, John saw, I saw this, I saw this. John will see this vision. He'll write it down. Then the blessing, verse 3. 
Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So these things will soon take place. The time is near or at hand. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, verse 11 gives you the seven churches by name. Chapters 2 and 3 gives detail to what was written to those churches. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. I think that's God the Father. Then from the seven spirits who are before his throne. If you compare that to Isaiah 11, 2, and also Zechariah 4, I think that's the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the Son, right? So you have the Trinity in verse 4 and part of verse 5. Jesus is now described as the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead ones, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved, loves us, present, and released us from our sins by his blood. So he presently loves us. He released us from our sins by providing his death on the cross, the crucifixion. And he, Jesus, made us to be a kingdom, should be a comma, priest to his God and father to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Last week, we looked at verse seven. Behold, he who's he. Jesus, he's coming with the clouds, Daniel seven. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Every eye is going to see him, but I think it narrows down to the Jews who pierced him. We looked at that. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. I take that to be the 12 tribes. So it will be amen. So we went to Zechariah 12. Well, they will in verse 10, they will look upon the one whom they've pierced. That was Israel. So we detailed verse seven. Now we come to verse eight. And you might want to throw up a prayer during this sermon for me so I can maintain my thoughts on this. This is very profound as I work through this. Um, and for yourself, too. <laughs> don't lose sight. If you get a little uh, uh, start struggling, don't give up. Don't turn and start looking outside and, and, and not think about what you're hearing. Um, this is our Lord. We want to give him at least this hour to think about who he is. So verse 8. Who's I? Oh, we got a, a Jesus crowd here, huh? <laughs> I think it is too, but we'll go on with this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is, who was, and is to come. Then he calls himself the Almighty. You think, okay, that's not much, right? This is amazing scripture. And so we're going to look at this today. So let's start with the first description right there in verse 8. The Lord God is called the Alpha and the Omega which most of you know, even if you never took any Greek, we're familiar with the Greek alphabet. The first letter is alpha. The last letter is omega. So he goes to the first and, and last letters of the, not the Hebrew alphabet, but the Greek alphabet. And God has given this description in other passages as well, as we'll see in a little bit. But he's also described as the first and the last so you have the first letters and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, but he's also called the first, the protos, and the last, the eschatos. Eschatology is where we get the study of last times or prophecy. He's also called what else that fits this pattern? The beginning and the end. Now, if that's the father... This is his description. It could be the son. We'll work on that as we go through. So the prophets refer to Yahweh as the first and the last. You know where? Thank you. Was anyone listening to open scripture reading? Isaiah 41. Uh, I, I'll only give you the one verse. But remember, in this context, it shows that all the events of history are overseen by God. 
He can take kings down. He can raise them up. Metaphorically, God has weapons to do so, his bow and so forth. Does God literally have a bow up there doing this? Does Jesus literally have a broad sword that comes out of his mouth? But no, those are the descriptions of his judgment. So he's the sovereign God, the eternal creator who precedes history and oversees it. So in Isaiah 41, 4, he culminates with this. Who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? Well, the answer, I, Yahweh, am the first and the last. I am he. So remember, if you haven't seen this, in Hebrew, you have two words for Lord, Adon, like my Lord, Adonai. Uh, then you have Yahweh, the four sacred consonants. This name is only used of the living God, never to a creature. However, Adon can be used of God, Deuteronomy 10, also used of men, but not Yahweh. So this is a description of Yahweh. He is, and so in your Bibles, most English Bibles do this. When they come to the sacred consonants, they put all four letters in English in caps, right? That's how you know Yahweh is the Hebrew. If you have capital L, small O-R-D, that's Adon or Adonai. Here we have Yahweh. So he's called the first and I'm with the last. Isaiah 44 does it again. Thus says Yahweh, the king of Israel and his redeemer. So who's the redeemer of Israel? Jesus. If that's what this means here, then who is Jesus? He's Yahweh. So he's deity. He's also the king of Israel, right? Isn't he the one who's going to rule the Messianic kingdom? So he goes on to say, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, I am the first and the last. There's no Elohim besides me. So is there any other God? Nope. The one true living God who's also, we know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we got this description, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Now look at Revelation 21.6. I have it up here. The same description for God occurs at the end of the book of Revelation. Revelation 21.6, Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Now he brings the beginning and the end up. And I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life if he gives me a lot of money. No, without cost. I think salvation's a free gift. Who is that, though? He said to me, who's he? This is where it gets tricky. Could be the father, could be the son. However, Revelation 22, 13 puts three similar descriptions of God in one verse. So now as you're trying to, the, my main struggle with this, is this the father or the son? And I want to know that. Because if it's the son, then Jesus is God. I got another awesome passage of many to show that he's full deity. I know that's redundant, right? You can't be anything less than deity. Either you're God or you're not. So when I say full deity, I'm intentional, intentional redundancy. How's that? I didn't make that up. I heard that the other day. So I am the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 22, 13, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. But who is speaking? Behold, I am coming quickly in verse 20, or sorry, verse uh, 12. My reward is with me to render every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I think that's Christ from the previous verse because it's him that's coming quickly and he'll come from heaven on the white horse, Revelation 19. So there's no question in 1.8 that the Lord God is the Alpha and the Omega and obviously the one who is, the one who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. But again, my question, are these descriptions referring to God the Father or God the Son? Now, if it's, if it's only the Father, I still have other passages for the deity of Christ. If this refers to Jesus, I got additional passages for the deity of Christ. 
by the way, before I get there, how many, how many of you ever talked to a Jehovah's Witness? Or do you lock the door and don't let them in? I talk to them all the time. And every time they go to the scripture that Jesus is almighty God. Nope, he's, he's mighty God, but he's not almighty God. And they go to, it's when you go to Isaiah 9, 6, where it calls him wonderful counselor, mighty God. The Hebrew doesn't say mighty God. I'd argue that it says warrior God. So we're, we're, it's not even a word for mighty versus almighty, like a, a, a greater versus a lesser. That's not even the Hebrew. And they'll go here and oh, they'll say in Isaiah 9, 6, well, he's not almighty God. Yes, he is. He's warrior God. Yahweh's a warrior. He is Yahweh. And then you can go here and they'll say all these are the father. Uh, what do you do with Revelation 22, 12 and 13? So there's one aspect of why it's important to know. And too many people who once believed in the deity of Christ have now left that teaching. Are you still saved? Are you really? Of course. You can get things wrong about God. It doesn't change your position. But can it hurt your walk? You bet it does. It turns Jesus into an idol, which he's not. But in your heart, that's all he is if he's less than God. And you worship him. Aren't we to worship Jesus? So now we're to worship something less than God. The implications are huge. So the argument that this is Christ is an is a awesome argument for the deity of Christ. But there are those that say it could be, be just the Father. So if you go back to 1.8, um, it Some arguments that it's the Father. If you go back to verse 4, it calls, I think, the Father, the one who is, the one who was, and who is to come. Right? And then in verse 5, it talks about Jesus. So some will say, see, if you go back to verse 4, with the same language of the one who was, who is, who is to come, if that's the Father, then it must still be the Father in one eight, Possibly. However, if Revelation 1.8 refers to Jesus, you could just tie it back to verse 7. Behold, he, Jesus, is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, Jesus, even those who pierced him, that's Christ. And all the tribes will mourn for him, Christ. Then in verse 8, still referring to Jesus. Because verse 8 says, I, if that's Jesus, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come. Uh, go back to our, or hold on, it's already up here. If you continue, go to Revelation 22 once more. In verse 12, look at it again. Behold, I am coming quickly. I think that's Christ. Wouldn't you believe that? My, my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I, that would be Jesus, and the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He gets all those titles. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life, that he may enter by the gates into the city. Outside of the dogs, the sorcerers, immoral, immoral persons, murderers and idolaters, everyone who loves and practices lying. But look at verse 16. Do you have the word Jesus there? Now it's ego Jesus. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you the things, these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David. Isn't that Jesus? Doesn't have Jesus there, but verse 16 begins with the word Jesus there. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So Christ is the ultimate descendant in the line of King David. So that whole context is Christ who is called the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So, point, if Alpha and Omega and 1-8 refer to Jesus, then Jesus is the Lord God, a title for deity. If the Alpha and Omega in verse 8 refers to the Father, and in Revelation twenty-two thirteen refers to Jesus, 
then the comparison shows that Jesus bears the same title as God the Father, right? I think I still have the deity of Christ either way because Christ is called the same thing the Father is. Are they two different persons? Yes, but the same God. You may call the Father Yahweh. You'd never call me Yahweh, would you, or you? But if you call Jesus Yahweh, he bears the same title, though a different person. So verse 8 calls the Lord, the Lord God. And then it says, who is, now here's where it gets very profound. Who is, who was, and who is to come. Everybody have that in their translation? Now this is definitely a title emphasizing the eternal being of God. Th doesn't the Alpha and the Omega put a limitation on something? Where, where would that limitation be? The beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, where's your mind going? Creation, right? I mean, there's a beginning of time, an end of time. Is he still there? Yeah, but he's also beyond it either way. So I, I started looking at this uh, over the months and especially this last week. We know God is the eternally existing one. Father, Son, and Spirit, eternal, having no end or beginning. Now, now hold on. Let me see if I have something. Um, read this with me. God is the one who is. Do you have that? The one who is? The Greek is a participle. You could translate it the one being. Now, just for this hour, I can do this with you, and hopefully you'll never forget it, but say this with me. Here's the Greek, ha-on, two words, ha, the article, on, say it, ha-on. In Greek, that's a participle of the to be verb. So remember, the participle usually has in English the ing. So could you say the one being? What does that describe about him? He just is, right? Okay, then the next one. Do you have and who was? This get, Brett, this one gets really weird. Try to figure out why there's a definite article with a finite verb. This is not a participle, but it has an article with a verb. I looked at Dan Wallace, this great Greek scholar, who said this is very peculiar. <laughs> you would translate this, not the one who was, but the one who kept on being. He never had a, had a beginning. So who was tells me it could just be, well, he was. I was at Kroger last week, point of time, right? Does that say I continually existed in, at Kroger for eternity? No. But this, in, in, when it refers to God, is, uh, the imperfect tense describes ongoing action in past time. So I think it should be translated not just he who was, but the one who kept on being. So he is, he's just the existing one. The existing one, he was, and now what? Who is to come. Which you could translate this, the coming one. I'll get back to that later. So is God eternal? I say so. The Lord God always was. This verse. But do we know another verse? I don't think I have one slide in order today. I think I, I probably have the wrong PowerPoint in the wrong order. So let me go. I'm kind of jumping around. What about this? Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born. We all know what mountains. Mountains were born. No, they just created. That's the idea. Or you, God, gave birth to the earth and the world, creation. Even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Is he eternal? He's the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the alpha, the omega, but he goes way eternally beyond our human existence and our time uh, on this earth or from creation to the new heavens and new earth. Now, I, I thought of this too, just trying to give you some application along the way with the participles and the articles and all that. 
Who wrote this? No one knows who wrote. Don't say God. That's true. The Holy Spirit. Moses. This is the only psalm in all the psalms attributed to Moses. This is a psalm about the Jews in the wilderness. And as I looked at this, I thought, why would he bring this up in verse 2 when they're in the wilderness after leaving Egypt and going to Canaan? Well, aren't we in a wilderness in our, of our own, so to speak? Where are we headed? Eternal glory with God. So why in the world would he bring up the eternal, everlasting creator while they're in the wilderness? As they're getting ready to go into Canaan and fight the huge enemies that made us look like grasshoppers, as they said. Why would he do that? Why would God do that? Wouldn't it be a little bit comforting to know that you have the everlasting God who transcends everything going with you into the land? Could that encourage you? As we encounter this hysteria over a virus compared to what could happen in our country is nothing. Doesn't it comfort you to know that the living God is with you? I mean, what, what a perspective to this little tiny planet, to this living God that's eternal. Don't you think that would have encouraged the Jews before he goes into this discussion on the wilderness wanderings? I, I think so. Moses does this with the Torah. What's the first? Now, remember, Moses, a lot of people don't know this. Moses wrote all five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He writes it during the wilderness wanderings like this psalm. But what does he start the whole Torah with? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why would he do that? Well, if they're going into the land of Canaan to fight giants, who's with them? The living God. Who's with you? The same one. I got nothing to worry about. Then he shows them in Exodus the deliverance, the easy deliverance through destroying the false gods of Egypt, which aren't even really gods anyway. It's the devil. Deuteronomy 32, 17 says behind all idolatry is demons. So you got, I give you that one, how I easily defeated the enemy. Do you have enemies too that you're dealing with? And we have all these struggles, but he brought them safely out of Egypt to headed for the promised land, which he will give them. So I'm looking at this same pattern. But you know what? I thought of this uh, yesterday. In Revelation, talking about all these horrible things, the difficulties in the church, right? Chapters 2 and 3 says there's all kinds of persecution. But be faithful till death and you'll receive the crown of life. But then he goes into the tribulation, 6 through 19. That's a cakewalk, right? That's going to be the worst thing that ever hit this world. Jesus said, if I hadn't cut those days short, nobody would have survived. But how does he open the book? The, the living God, the first and the last, the one who was, always was, the one being, the one coming. It's the same encouragement. So people go, I don't really read Revelation 1. I just go to the chapter 6 and want to hear prophecy. Well, you're going to miss chapter 1, which gives you all the stability of this living Christ who is with us the whole way through. So even the book of Revelation has that encouraging pattern. How about Paul? Does he ever encourage us about this horrible world versus who we have? How about this one? Romans 8, 31. You'll all quote it. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? What's the answer? No one. <laughs> if God is for us, no one. Now, we might die of something, but where do we go? Home. Oh, that would be horrible. I want to stay here. I, the only reason I really, I mean, I have reasons I want to stay here. My wife and I argue over this. And when I give my eternal perspective, it sounds like I don't want to be around her, you know. You don't want to be with me? He, I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> but then on one day, she'll say the same thing back and I quit back. Oh, I guess you don't care about me and... But ultimately, when we die, we go to him. Um, I want to be around to keep ministering in his behalf. Not to eat more cheesecake because I like it and I'd like to have more. Um, that's not a hint to bring me a cheesecake. But, but I, 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 I want to serve him. And if there's something he wants me to do to help further his purpose, then I need to be here. But when he's ready to bring me home, then do it. Oh, death, oh, that's so horrible. Well, 
What did Paul say in Philippians 1.21? For to me, to live is Christ presently, but to die is what? He looked at it as kerdos, gain or profit. And a lot of Christians, shame on us, we look at it as the most horrible thing that I want to avoid with all I can. And you can't. You, you can't. Uh, uh, I remember a guy at a funeral said, death is an appointment we'll all keep. And then he added, nobody will be late. You know, people are late for everything. Some people even late for funerals when they're attending them. He goes, you'll be, you'll be on time for yours. And so we, got, we can't fear this. We can't fear death. We have life, live, uh, we have the living Christ living in us. Now, Paul didn't have this attitude when he was five years old that we know of. Don't you have to grow in your, in your walk? And, and that's, yeah, it takes time to get there. All right. Okay. I think this slide's in order now. <laughs> so again, Revelation 1.8, the one who is, uh, what was that word? Two words. Ha-on, the one, who, the one being and the one who kept on being and the coming one. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty. Now I'm going to take apart all three of those phrases. The one who is, the one who was, the one to come. And the chances of me ever doing this again are slim. So I'm going to do this this hour. And Greg, is this recording? <laughs> if not, I'll do it next week. Because <laughs> I want you to just think about the God you have on your side. So let's start with number one. I have it highlighted in blue. Who is most translations say that, ha'on in the Greek, which means the one being, or you could say the one who exists. What's it, you know what a to be verb is? The verb of existence. You probably use it a thousand times a day. I was at the store. I will go. That's all a form of the to be verb. It is a nice day. It, what is is? Same verb. We just put it in tense, first, second, third person, singular, plural. We all had to go through this in school, right? You know, I, I am more grateful for grammar school growing up because studying the Bible, I realize God's the author of language and verbs and nouns and objects and all that. So to know him better, the more I know grammar, the more I can understand him. You understand? I mean, we're talking with grammar. Words make a difference. Past tense, future tense, it all makes a difference. So God is going to reveal himself to, to us. All scriptures God breathed right down to these participles and that little definite article is there for a reason. So the one who is, you could say the one being, the one who exists. So God is the self-existing one, the sustainer of all things. Remember, Jesus sustains the entire universe by the word of his power, Hebrews 1. And then he's a being who relies on no one or nothing to sustain himself. But what do creatures need? Someone to sustain them. And all these Christians are running around going, it's, it's evolution, it's mother nature. Really, that's, just, that's the one who sustains you? That's the one that's giving this, this world oxygen, providing sunlight so crops will grow, the seeds, all this he creates, and then the food we eat is of him. Even that hamburger you ate, God made that cow, right? <laughs> and we don't even uh, uh, give him the praise for that. But God, we need him to sustain us. Uh, I've heard more people say in this last two weeks, God, we're so needy of God. We need him so much. Has, has that been coming out? We're so dependent on him. One, one uh, uh, deadly virus that could kill anyone if it was one that killed you in 24 hours could wipe out a whole world in no time. We need God, but he needs no one to sustain himself. If you say, God, what's sustaining you? What's he going to say? Me. <laughs> I'm the self-existing one. Now, I'm going to ask you this. See if you're doing what I'm doing. If God is called the one being, using a to be verb to describe him being the self-existing one, where does your mind go in the Old Testament? Somebody. What? Y'all probably are having a bunch of good ones. Who said Exodus? Exodus 3, because of the language. So go back there. <clears throat> so 
So John describes the Lord as the one being, the self-existing one. He's using a to-be verb in Greek language to describe this God. God reveals himself to Moses with a to-be verb. But now it's Hebrew. Again, if you're not, I want you to say this is so profound. It should be huge and and. Uh, I'm struggling for the words to say how magnificent it is, how profound God is. I'm just trying to pull back some onion layers in my faith. I just can't ever get to the core. He's just too big. So Exodus 3.14, remember Moses is on Mount Sinai. Uh, God tells him to take off his sandals. You're on what? Holy ground. So you're in the presence of the holy God. So think of that. I think it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the manifest person of the Godhead. So God can be everywhere, omnipresent, but he can also be located in one specific location, talking to one man. Can you explain that to me in great detail? I just believe it. That's who he is. So he's telling Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt to get my people and you'll come back to this mountain. And then Moses says, well, when I go to the people, who do I tell them you are? What is your name? And here's verse 14. I'm the lamb of God. I am the good shepherd. I am the rock. Not here. He says to Moses, eh, yeah, Esher, eh, yeah. Here, eh, yeah, repeated twice. That's the first person of the to be verb. I am not that I am. Does anyone have that? No, it's a personal masculine pronoun. He's a he, not a, not a that or an it. I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Eh yes, shalechani aleichem. I am has sent me to y'all. What's his name? I am. Can you call yourself that? So you, you read this and you go, that's a to be verb in the first person. So what is he? The ever-present, self-existing God. He just is. I'm trying to think in language, how could you express this any better in language that we could understand? What what was he called? I am. What was he called in Revelation? What were those two words? Ha-on. The one being. Now, let me turn this up. Some of you know what the Septuagint is, right? Or should I pause 30 seconds and let you chew? (laughs) The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Now, in Hebrew, they double the the same verb, ehye, and then ehye again two times. And then the third time, it's used as well in that last line. However, when you get to the Septuagint, the Greek writers did this. I am the one being, ha'on. That's how they wrote down the I am, the one being. So you have ego a me ha'on, I am the one being. I guess they could have said ego a me. And then the pronoun that ego a me again, they didn't do that. They use ha'on. Again, that's the same Greek that John uses of this God, the existing one. I think it drives you back to Exodus 3. This is the living, self-existing God. And then he says in the Greek, you shall say to the sons of Israel, ha'on apostelkin me, um, The one being has sent me. So even the Septuagint, I know it's not inspired. It helps me understand that the Greek language looked at that with that participle as John does with God in Revelation 1.8. So I'm going to say this without going into detail. The word Yahweh is the same root of the verb I am. It's still a to be verb. So when you say, eh, yeah, I am, Yahweh means he is. It's still the to be verb. So when God speaks to us, what does he say? I am. When we look at him, what do we say? He is. And uh, by the way, Dr. Ross did a paper on that to show that it's the same root. Uh, uh, we just heard Dr. Ross together at the conference. And, and, uh, and Dr. Allen defended this. I think Chisholm did as well. To show the etymology, it's the same verbal root. So when you see Yahweh, we say, well, that's the Lord. What does that mean, though? 
What does the word Lord mean? It's the self-existing one. That's what would come to mind um, when you see that word. That's a whole other argument that we'll have to wait. Now, so what was that name in Revelation 1-8 for God? Ha'on, the article with on, the participle. And he was also called the one who was or kept on being. That's Ha'ain, not Ha'on, but now it goes to Ha'ain. Now, when you hear that God kept on being, where does your mind go now? John 1.1. 1, 1. Chris, that's three today, so you can go. <laughs> Remember in school, you got rewarded for getting answers right. You get to leave early, one minute early to go to the bus. That was the coolest thing. No, don't leave. Stay here. John 1.1. 1, 1. Go there. Now, the, Revelation 1.8, he's the one being. He's also the ha'ain, the one who kept on being. Now, watch this. I think it's Jesus Christ in Revelation 1.8. Look what it says of Jesus, no doubt here. John 1.1, 1, 1, the most profound verse in the Bible, starts the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. How many times do you see the to be verb? What is it and how many times? I just used it to say, ask the question, what is it? That's a to be verb. The word was is the to be verb. It's a past tense. Um, three times. You see the word ain? There it is. Three times. Jesus is called the one who was, the one who kept on being. Ha ain. So I'm looking at this. If you translate this properly, who, the imperfect tense, who kept on being, do it this way. In the beginning, I think creation, didn't God create everything in the beginning? Kept on being the word. Who's the word? Jesus Christ. So in the beginning, when all things were created, who kept on uh, being in existence? Christ. How far back? No beginning. Psalm 90 verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Next phrase, and the word, the logos is Jesus. Remember, the word became flesh. So the word kept on being with God. But he is God, though, right? So how can he keep on being with God if verse 2 is accurate? Who is God there? The Father. So if the Father existed eternally, who else existed eternally with him? The Son. And then he says, and... Kai theos ain halagos, and the word was God, or the word kept on being God. Not with God, as he is God. And watch out for the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's a God, as they say. Wrong, false teaching, bad grammar. Not what it says. It's not a little g, there's no a there. It's God, he is the living God. And if you go that way, you've just destroyed the deity of Christ in your own heart. And now you've got an idol. And I pray God gets you back somehow. I'm trying to insulate you from that too today. Now check this one out. Now those are all imperfect tenses. Kept on being, kept on being, kept on being. Here's another interesting one, not with the to be verb. Remember Jesus, he, so he's on this earth. The word became flesh, 114. He's rejected by Israel. He's doing his high priestly prayer in John 17. And he says this in his prayer. This is profound. Now, Father, glorify me, the Son, with yourself, the Father. Okay, weren't they eternally existing? John 1, 1. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. So in the beginning at creation, kept on being the, the Father and the Son. But he doesn't say, I had with you, it's I kept on having. The, the, the tense is not a past tense simply, it's an ongoing action in perfect tense. So Jesus had an eternal relationship with the triune God, with the Father and the Spirit. 
He became flesh, John 1, 1, 1, 14. And now he prays when he goes back, give me that same glory I kept on always having with you from eternity past. And people go, I don't believe in the Trinity. You're not reading the Bible. They say, y'all made that up. A comparison of scriptures has to show three different persons in one God. All three persons are infinite, co-eternal, but not the same person. Didn't I warn you this would be a head stretcher today? But hey, take it up with God and say, why did you reveal yourself this way in these languages? Right? And there was a day when I, at salvation, I knew zero about the Bible except the gospel. And if he can take this dummy to a point where I can have any understanding of it, he can take anyone there, right? That's why I'm glad he used me because now no one can come up and go, well, you must have been valedictorian of your school or something. No, dummy, average student, didn't really apply myself much in college. But when, I, when it came to this, I went back to my grammar <laughs> as a kid and said, I've got to know this because this is my God who's revealing himself. And you don't have to have a Mensa IQ to understand it. You just have to have desire and let God through time show you. Amen. <laughs> okay. The next title, the one, the one who is to come. Everyone have that. You may say you're going to be a little picky on this one, but it says the coming one because it's a participle again. Now, the one, who, the, one, uh, the, the one who is to come and the coming one, that's an okay translation. But I'm going to show you the coming one as a better translation for a reason. Another reason why I think Jesus is referred to in Revelation 1.8 because he's called the coming one. That's a messianic title, a title of Jesus the Messiah. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect this to three passages, Revelation 1, 8 at the top. And then show you something that some Bibles don't highlight well enough in the translation. Okay, again, let's just do it from up here. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, or the coming one, the Almighty. Now, in Psalm 118... Remember that psalm? Listen to these words. Starting in verse 22, I have verse 26 up there. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Who is that? Peter says that's Jesus. He quotes that and says Christ was rejected. He was the chief cornerstone. The most important one in the building. He says in verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is, now, we always quote this when it's a pretty day. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, fine. Rejoice in every day. But what is the day that the Lord has made? Possibly the day when the Messiah comes to rule. He came and was rejected, right? The cornerstone. Now he's going to have to come back. We pull verses out of context and that's... Rejoice in every day. I'm fine with that. But contextually, I think it's more than that. So verse 25, O oh Lord, do save. We beseech you. What did they say to Jesus when he rides in on the donkey? Hosan, Hoshia, Na, which means Lord, save us or save us now. The, no, sorry. He says the, the kingdom was rejected. I got to come back for that day, that wonderful day. Oh, Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. And then it says in verse 26, Baruch Abba Bashem Yahweh. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house. That would be the temple of the Lord. So what's interesting, the blessed person in Psalm 118 is the one who comes to the temple to worship God. Isn't he a blessed one for doing that? But who is really the one who comes in the name of the Lord who's ultimately blessed? Jesus Christ. So keep reading. When you get to Matthew, the reason I'm uh, where it says in Psalm 118, 26, the one coming in the name of the Lord is a participle of Bo. Bo means to come. Haba means the one coming or the coming one. So Jesus is described in Revelation 1, 8 as the coming one. 
Who is the one who will come in the name of the Lord to establish the, the kingdom? Jesus. Came in on the donkey, laid down his life, comes back on the white horse to bring in the kingdom. So you get to the life of Jesus. Oh, by the way, for you Septuagint readers, ha er kamenos, the same words, the coming one that Revelation 1.8 uses. Anyway, so Jesus comes at his first advent. He begins to minister. John the Baptist said this. Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? You remember that? You know what he asked? Are you the coming one? What is he thinking in his mind? This Messiah is the coming one to establish the kingdom. So he uses the same participle as John, Revelation 1.8. So Jesus is the coming one. Now, should John wait for someone else? No, he was it. I know there's complexities. Did he not really believe it and all that? Or is he just basically saying, I know you're the one. Let's get this show on the road. You know, what are you waiting for? You're here, you know. But I'm just showing you the language there. So Jesus is rejected. He was the coming one. And in Matthew 23, 39, he says to the Pharisees, they're the reason he has to go to heaven and come back later. He says, from now on, you... The leaders, you will not see me again until you say what? Baruch Abba Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So now he just connects Psalm 118. And he is the coming one, as John asked. But you're going to have to call me back. And this nation will call him back. And he's the one coming in the name of the Lord to defeat the enemy and establish the kingdom. So Jesus was the Savior Messiah who was to come, rejected by Israel. So he will return as Revelation 1-7, coming with the clouds of heaven and every eye will see him. So to put it simply, Jesus is the one who is Ha'on, the self-existent God. He is the one who kept on being the eternal God with no end or beginning and the coming one, the Messiah who will return and establish the kingdom. This is Christology, brothers. This is who our Lord is. And I spent hours and hours on this, and it was worth every minute. Because the goal when you do this is to not just get through it, but to worship God through it. And to say, this is enjoyable. Thank you for showing me. And I just pray I'm accurate in everything I'm saying. That's why I opened my toolbox so for you to enjoy. Now we got to look at this last term before we close up. Revelation 1.8, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who, who is or the one being, who was or kept on being, and the coming one. Now he's called the Almighty. The Ha Pantocrator. Uh, this Greek word means the all-powerful one, the Almighty So what attribute of God does this describe? Omnipotence, all-powerful. Now this word, interesting enough, this word shows up ten times in the New Testament, nine of them in Revelation. Again, why would John focus on that to his audience and even people who will probably read this during the tribulation? If Satan is powerful and, and, and wreaking all this havoc, who's more powerful? God, that's why you need to really nail down chapter one, because I I remember when I first became a Christian and started studying the Bible, somebody said, well, I read Revelation. It was so disturbing. I was in such fear, meaning I only read Revelation six through 19. You shouldn't fear this. It, It is troubling. But if you read chapter one, you're like, I'm good. One, I think we're going to be raptured before the tribulation. I'm very hopeful for that. But even if we had to go through every, every year of it, we have the omnipotent God. So again, the same question arises with the other descriptions. Is this almighty, the father or the son? I don't have time to develop all the uses of it, of the nine that are there, which are all listed on the slide. Second Corinthians 618 is the only one outside of Revelation. Then Revelation 1.8. 4, 8, 11, 17, 15, 3, 16, 7, 
16, 14, 19, 6, 19, 15, 21, 22. Now, as I went through every one of those, it's difficult. Uh, is it the father or the son? Um, there's some challenges there. Some of them look very close. It could be either one. I'm going with Jesus in our passage. So if, number one, it refers to Jesus Christ, then Jesus is God, right? He is the Almighty. Um, the omnipotent God can only be the true God. So Jesus is God. However, if it refers to the Father, and any other use of Almighty is used of Jesus, it would demonstrate that Jesus is God, equal in omnipotence with the Father, but a distinct person who bears the same title. I think I'm good either way. So as a principle, Christ or the Father, God is almighty, the omnipotent God who is more than able to work out his divine purposes in human history. And if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're on the good side, you're fine. Doesn't mean you can't stumble and make a mess of things, but you belong to the Lord no matter what. Good to know when times are tough. Good to know when times are good, right? We often forget him in the simple times. See, this is the time when you you load up on the word of God. Because what happens when we can't meet? We're meeting here today. What if it was something so bad you can't even go outside your doors? And we can't congregate. Where are you going to get this? Well, online. You can do it online. I could. What if we lose electricity? What's in your heart? Hopefully this. Could, could they take your Bibles from you? And we, how much would you have in your own soul that you could draw on and for how long? One of the reasons I do this, <laughs> I want that, and then I want you to have it too. So Dr. Walvoord, I've quoted him many times, one of the best prophecy scholars of the last century who died not that long ago. He said this of Revelation 1.8. He said in the concluding salutation in verse 8, Christ is quoted as declaring himself to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet, and the beginning and the ending, that is the eternal one. The eternity, present power, and future glory of Christ are in view. The description of the Father given in verse 4, which I hold to as well, is then repeated, concluding with the title, The Almighty, a word which occurs ten times in the New Testament, nine instances being in Revelation. It is probable that verse 8 applies to Christ and the ascription of eternity in verse 4 to the Father. That's how I'm interpreting it as well. There's no reason, however, why eternity should not be ascribed to Christ as well as the Father, quoting Revelation 1, 10 through 18, 22, 12, and 13. <clears throat> so we've seen today that God describes himself as the beginning and the end the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. But we know from Psalm 90, verse 2, he's from everlasting to everlasting and many other passages that speak of his eternality. So as I look at this, he seems to be focusing on time, history. The first, he's there at the beginning, the last, the end, all of it, the first letter of the alphabet in Greek and the last as well. You know, as I look at this, this seems to be a merism. A merism is a figure of speech where you take two opposites or extremes to explain the totality. We use them all the time. Mothers will say when their kids come out, come from outside playing in the dirt, don't come in here, you're covered head to toe with mud. If his t-shirt's real dirty, can't they say head to toe? It's a merism showing the totality. You're completely dirty using extreme in language. Don't we use A to Z for the totality? You might get a gardening book titled Gardening from A to Z. What does that tell you? Everything you need to know about gardening and its totality. So God is eternal. He's eternal God, unlimited by time. The creator God with no beginning or end. However, imminent and transcendent. He's within his world, but he's also beyond it. So is there any place you can go and get away from God? Doesn't the psalmist say that? Wherever I go, up, into the earth, you are there. Not that he wants to get away from him, but you couldn't anyway. 
Now, can God do anything? Nope. You can't tell him, get lost. Can he? Go away. Can't. <laughs> don't be, don't uh, exist eternally. You can't do that. Make me God. Can't do that either. How about God? Why don't you lie? Can't lie. Don't love anymore. Can't do that. I'm perfect love. He's just who he is. So he's transcendent. He's eminent. And transcendent, eminent within his world, transcendent beyond it, beyond it. He's at the beginning of all things, right? He's also at the end. And who will be standing at the end when all things turn to a new heavens and a new earth? When all the smoke clears, Jesus Christ will be there and will be with him. So God is sovereign over all the affairs of life. Close to finishing, I'll quote D.A. Carson. I'm going to go ahead and do it. He says this, quote, The declaration that God is the Alpha and the Omega in Revelation 1.8 is a pictorial way of affirming that God is the sovereign Lord of all the ages. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. The equivalent in English would be I am the A and Z. Jews were accustomed to use an equivalent mode of speech in their own language. Listen to this. The rabbis, for example, said that Adam transgressed the law from A to Z, whereas Abraham kept the law from A to Z. That suggests that I am the Alpha and the Omega means I'm the beginning of history and the end of history and the Lord of all that lies between. The Almighty maintains his control over the world from the beginning to the end of all time even when the powers of this world resist his will. And he intends to come and complete his good purpose for it. Good to know when times are bad. So this discussion may seem tedious, but we're, as I said, dealing with the descriptions of the living God. So it's extremely important and we're commanded to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. He commanded me to do that And I'm commanded to teach it. That's why I'm doing this. And also, you might encounter the Jehovah's Witnesses who will come to your house and say, Jesus is not, he's mighty God, but not almighty God and a created being. I can easily defeat that now. This sermon alone would defeat it. Because they're going to the same Bible we are, I would argue, using these scriptures, that that's heresy. So Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God who, who is, who always was, who is the coming one, the Almighty. So we know in John 1, he's eternal. Verse 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh. And during his incarnation, Jesus Christ did something that no one has ever done. No one will ever do and no one ever could do. And what is that? Went to the cross to die for our sins. He's the only one qualified because he's perfect. The problem of man's sin, it's a human problem. But God can only solve it. So God has to become flesh. That defeats any possibility of a savior in these other religions because all their people are what? Fallen humans. Muhammad cannot do anything for you. He's dead now anyway, right? Jesus is the living God. So if the sin problem's human, he dies for humans. But it's a God uh, 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 solution, so God has to do it. And we have Jesus Christ, the Word become flesh. So he's the only one who has qualified to do it, the one who ever would do it or could do it. So listen to these words in 1 Peter 2. Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might... Or having died to sins, we might live for righteousness, for by his wound you were healed. So he goes to the cross to pay the ultimate price. Romans 5, 8 says, For God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us. So he paid the price. He died for all men and all sin. So what what does man need to do? Maybe an opportunity that you'll have in, in all this hysteria because when people get scared, they often want to know oh, what, could, what could happen if I die and they want to know about the afterlife. And 
So the Bible's clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Uh, For he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe stands judged already because he hasn't believed in the name of the only son of God. So in that, uh, I mean, Martha said it perfectly. Isn't that really the most important thing? Because whether we have perfect health and great economy, we're all going to die, right? You might die, well, I got something right there at the end in my million-dollar home, but you're still going to meet the Lord. And as the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5.15, you came naked into this world, you go the same way. You take nothing from this world uh, into the presence of God. So we're all going to get there eventually one way or the other. So ultimately, if we don't have Jesus Christ, you got nothing. The other side is if you have Christ, you got everything. Even though we might be without for a time or food or clothing and things like that. But how many saints are in heaven now that said, let me tell you about suffering and what I was without and how I died. Talk to the apostle Peter. Jesus predicted when he died, they're going to take you away and lead you where you don't want to go. Oh, wait a minute. Why did I sign up for this? But Peter didn't say that. He knows where he's going to go when he dies. And some of us might die peacefully in our bed. Um, I wonder, which, what is the best way to go? Seems to be special reward for the worst suffering and enduring it. Would we want to do over once we see the other side? No, I want it harder. Let me go back. And none of us want that. I get it. But you, when you look at it from the Bible's perspective, it makes you wonder. But all of you have believed in Christ. I know everyone in this room. And if you have, then you have eternal life. You, he'll never let anyone pluck you from his hand. We're eternally secure. So be wise, obviously, in things that come up, like our virus and so forth. Um, obviously, they won't want to intentionally spread things and make people sick. Wash your hands and do all that. But don't panic and get into this fear thing where we lose our sight of God and become carnal in the process and uh, act like those who fear. Because remember, perfect love casts out fear. John puts love and fear as an opposite. So if we lose our our, uh, personal love for God in our walk, then uh, fear will, will replace that. But be ready to minister to those who might be in fear. Look at it. It might be an awesome opportunity. As some of you have already said, it's given me opportunities to witness already. Um, So let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for our time. We thank you that we were able to gather today. And we pray uh, um, for our physical safety, our health. And Lord, from anything, from any disease, from from any flu or anything we could get. We just pray for for health and that we would be wise in that regard with other people. And Lord, we want to lift up Glenn as he is recovering in the hospital and lift up Linda as she is um, looking on and and, and dealing with that. And I know that's got to be difficult for her, even at her age, and uh, trying to deal with being away from her home and so forth. And Lord, may we be able to help her in some way. May those needs be made known. But we pray for Glenn's quick, quick recovery so he can come back home. We pray for those who are, are ill, not only in uh, our country, but abroad. We just pray for uh, physical health. But Lord, not an independent of you, that somehow you'd get the glory. We pray for people to look to you and that Christians would have the solution or give the ac- accurate solution of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we be strong and a source of encouragement in any time of suffering. So, Lord, bring us back next week healthy as we meet on Tuesday, Wednesday, and then again next Sunday. Uh, We'll give you the praise today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. In Jesus we pray. Amen.